How did, how did everybody do this week on their homework? We were to go over chapter two of Acts. What an, what an exciting, I love Acts. It's like a, mm, I'm going to say this tongue in cheek. It's kind of like a soap opera because it's like, it's crazy. You know, it's here, it's here. There's all kinds of wild things going on. It's certainly not boring, that's for sure. <laughs> and chapter two is not boring at all. So what did you, just kind of to begin with, how did you, um, how did you process the goings on of chapter two? There were some major, major things that happened in the book of Acts in, in the second chapter. We see the falling of the Holy Spirit on the disciples and them speaking in different languages on the day of Pentecost. Uh, so that was new. Um, we see <clears throat> Peter giving a very heartfelt very convicting message to the Jews that prompted an, a, an amazing response. And then we see the disciples and the follower, all the followers, the new followers of Christ, living in a way um, as the church that is unbelievably powerful then and now. So there's, you know, at least those three major things that happened. Um, so first thoughts before we dig into our, our book and our questions. I've got some different questions. I always think the most, one of the most exciting things in the New Testament is when the Holy Spirit comes to all these people who are waiting. It's just the excitement thing that how you know, how did that feel when the Holy Spirit just came and there was all this stuff going on? And it's like, I just think that would have been an exciting moment to be there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Very exciting. Yeah. I never noticed that the tongues of fire appeared to them and then spread to each believer. I just assumed that you know, that there would, you know, they would appear over the believer's head, but no, they came into the house and then they went to all the believers. Mm -hmm. I didn't notice that. Okay. I so on that note, I mean, how freaked out do you get when there's a flame sitting on someone's head? You know, I mean, because for us, I'd be like, one of the first responses would be to like try to put it out, and now you're just slapping somebody on the head. <laughs> I've had my, I've set my hair on fire before, and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. Let me just say, <laughs> but you're dancing, but not the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness, what a fun thing. I will think of the wind, totally different than now. Yes, the wind. <coughs> so. I guess, you know, on, when they make the movies and stuff, there is a wind going around. I mean, here it says they heard, heard the wind, it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't an actual wind. That yeah. was something that right. caught my attention, too. And I yeah. think, I don't know if it's Barkley or Rearsby who mentions that, the, that specific that they didn't feel the wind they heard the wind so that's another one of those odd things where it's like you know with us living in Ridgecrest we definitely feel the wind so if I was hearing it and nothing was around me was blowing it would certainly capture my attention yeah but yes that I've been living in Ridgecrest it's like well hopefully we wouldn't miss it <laughs> it's like I was just another wind yeah but if you heard it in your house you you would think that was yes. kind of strange. Yes, if it was in the house, I would be perplexed. <laughs> with, to say, with my head on fire. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about the fire, though, that doesn't consume, what's the, what was our first, our first experience with that in the Bible? Huh? Burning bush. Burning bush. Burning bush. Oh, yeah. Oh, then. Yeah. And Daniel. Yeah, different, different situation. But, yeah, the fire of God that didn't consume was in the, the burning bush. Okay, anything else on that part before we dig into some specifics? Well, um, I'm going to share this even though I feel a little weird doing so. My daughter, one of my daughters, uh, who was very young and not versed in the Bible at all, she woke up one morning, she told me she had this dream, she saw faces and things like that. She also saw, my kids are adopted out of the foster care system, and um, so we pray for their biological family uh, pretty much every day. And um, even though my kids don't really think about it, or sometimes they pray for them with gritted teeth, let's put it that way, um, especially the my other one, she never thinks about them. But anyhow, she woke up in the dream and she goes, Mom. And she started telling me all these things. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's scripture, that's scripture, that's scripture. And 
she goes, Mom, they all have this wire on their head. Like she said, she said that she saw these guys at a restaurant, her biological parents, on one table, and a bunch of Christians at another table. And she said she knew they were Christians because they had fire on their head. And I said, they had fire on their head? And she goes, yeah. It was about this much above their head, and it looked like liquid glass. Ooh. She said you could see through it, but it looked like liquid glass. And she said that uh, Jesus walked by and said, I don't remember what he said to her. And then right after that, the Christians from the one table were witnessing to the biological parents, and then all of a sudden they had the liquid glass on their heads. Hmm. And she said it was the shape of a flame, but yeah. Anyhow, for me, <laughs> that is really neat. Wow, I hadn't even thought about it too. Because again, I think you know, because of our humanness, you see, you hear the word flame, we automatically think flame, like you know, in a fireplace or barbecue or something. Not to, you know, thinking about that, it may not be an actual orange flame. Interesting. Um, okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask you guys this, just because I, you know, I had to process it a little bit and still think about it. Um, since we're talking about the Holy Spirit coming on to the disciples, so, okay, so Luke does us the favor in the beginning there of telling us all of the different languages that the, that the, the apostles were speaking in. Um, there were several, and we know that there were you know, multitudes of people there because it was Pentecost and, you know, 50 days after the Passover. So Jerusalem had probably been quite busy for some time because they would have had the feasts and the festivals. Um, <clears throat> okay, on the bottom of page 24 in Barclay where it says the first Christian preaching, the paragraph right above that. Um, now remember when we had the first, the last couple of weeks when we were talking, I've, I've been letting you guys know this is a commentary. This is by a man. Who's, who's interpreting, you know, what he feels God is telling him of Scripture. So we may not always agree with what they're saying. So I already ran across something that I didn't quite agree with. <laughs> um, he says, it seems most likely that Luke, a Gentile, had confused speaking with tongues with speaking in foreign languages. What happened was that, for the first time in their lives, this mixed crowd was hearing the Word of God in a way that struck straight home to their hearts that they could understand power of the Spirit was such that it had given the disciples a message that could reach every heart. Um, right above that, he kind of says that Luke confused languages with tongues as in mentioned in 1 Corinthians 14 because of the use of the word tongues. Agree? Disagree? Go. <laughs> I it was a really interesting commentary because as I read this, I wasn't sure if he was implying that um, as they heard as they heard tongues, uh, their brain translated it into their own language. Mm. I, I don't know if that's what he's insinuating okay. or if he's just insinuating. I, I have no idea, but it was a very interesting comment. Right. Not necessarily that I agree with it, but um, it made me think. Okay. I thought this other book that we were reading, I was just looking for, that said that the word, the Hebrew word for tongues also meant language. Mm -hmm. So if part of it was just an interpretation right. of that word. Yeah, it's right. Page 37. I think at this time, though, when they did were speaking in tongues, it was languages mm -hmm. that everybody could hear. And right. so not to say that God can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, I mean, because to me, you know, because we talked about the fact that Luke being a physician is very thorough and detailed in his documentation, and I, I, I had a hard time accepting the idea that all of a sudden he would flub up. Not that, you know, he's not, he's not, you know, human, but if we were to say that the Bible is the inspired word of God, I'm pretty sure that God inspired Luke <laughs> as well as the others, even though Luke hadn't been there. Because um, he would have, you know, because it's very specific. They heard them in their own languages. So I just found it interesting and thought it might be kind of a, a neat topic to just kind of look at. You can see we're using two very specific um, commentaries that are actually saying almost two different things. Right. Yeah, I don't think Luke was confused. I don't think so either. Yeah. I think that doesn't make sense. 
Yeah. But it kind of helps us to think about it a little a little more deeply, you know, and stretch our finite thinking. Um, the one thing that uh, Wearsby did say on page 38 that I thought was kind of a neat, I hadn't even really thought about it. Um, at the top of page 38, he says, why, okay, talking about, you know, uh, the languages, the believers praising God in the spirit in languages that are known, and he says, why did God do this? For one thing, Pentecost was a reversal of the judgment at the, to at the Tower of Babel when God confused man's language. How do you guys think about that? Because I had never thought of it that way. I know that's really interesting too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so are we familiar familiar with what happened at the Tower of Babel? And yeah, okay. So just knowing that. And I can kind of see where, you know, maybe he's going that direction because the Tower of Babel was a man-made, self-glorifying time. Look at how wonderful we are, how great we are, and at the time there was one language on the earth. And so God confused their languages, which to me is kind of cool because like, oh, that's why we all speak different languages. <laughs> um, but then to bring, it, to bring it back to that as a reversal, um, in order that the world would know. Yeah. Jesus, you know. Yeah. Hmm. Hi. Joe bring his coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but not enough straws. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of, that was in very, very interesting as well, too. So. Um, okay, so when, so back to Barclay really quick. Have have you guys read through First Corinthians fourteen um, on the chapter about speaking in tongues? Some some of us have, some of us haven't. Okay. So um, he refers to that. Oh, I don't know my Bible upstairs. All right. So if you've got your Bibles with you, let's turn to First Corinthians fourteen, just so we can have a little bit of. Um, a little bit of context here as to what what Barclay was talking about. Okay. So in first Corinthians fourteen and verse two. Would anybody like to read that verse? Kick us off. Okay, thank you. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysterious mis mysteries. Okay, thank you. So, in here, how is it describing a tongue? It's a mystery. Mysterious. mysterious. And now we have this definition of not understanding they're not talking to men but to God okay so how what is how is that different in Acts 2 who were the apostles talking to people the people that were people there. right um, okay so then let's go down to then Paul goes into discussing prophecies because a lot of this what he was talking about had to do with speaking of tongues in the act of prophecy inside of the church um, Verse 4 says that he who speaks in a tongue edifies or encourages himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather you have prophecy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. So what is needed for the church to understand the tongues? An interpreter. Have you guys ever experienced that in a church, speaking in tongues? And, and did you have experience where there was also an interpreter? Did you? What was that like? It was really, it was great. It was interesting. Yeah. It was like somebody spoke in tongues and then somebody stood up from behind us mm -hmm. and spoke what was said. At the time, the interpretation was that we are ambassadors for 
Jesus that we were to go and preach the gospel. Um, like I mean, um, well, that, that is very clear. Even like in a pig, they can partially do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it can be something that is weird, you know, I mean, if you've never experienced it before, you might feel kind of awkward, not really know what's going on, um, and then, you know, it's interesting, the, the Bible, what Paul says in here, what he, um, what his encouragement in here is that if somebody inside of a church does speak in a tongue to the church, that there must be an interpreter. Um, it's very important because otherwise, you know, it, loosely translated, people are going to think you're just nuts. <laughs> and they're not going to come to your church anymore. <laughs> so it has to be, you know, there has to be an interpreter um, when it's a message to the church and it's, and, you know, somebody's speaking in tongues that way. Otherwise, there's another form of tongues that, you know, when he says to edify oneself, and it's, a lot of times it's called a prayer language. Um, a lot of times people will speak in a tongue to themselves and it's in prayer and it's not maybe a language that they're anything known to them. It's a communication directly to God. And so there's a couple of differences there. So I think, you know, as we're looking at the book of Acts in chapter 2, we need to be very, very specific to know. And thankfully Luke does make it very clear. These guys were speaking in known languages that the people there could understand um, so obviously it didn't require an interpreter because it wasn't a weird, unknown language. Um, so that's why I just kind of thought, I like picking at stuff like that just because it makes us think. <laughs> it makes us think a little bit. But um, so here these guys are. It's obviously 9 o'clock in the morning, and they're speaking languages. What did they get accused of doing? Drinking. Being drunk. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. And so, of course, you know, they're like, no, these guys aren't drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, but so then it goes into it goes into Peter's, you know, it starts working into Peter's, um, Peter's message to the Jews. Why do you think, you know, these guys, so what were the circumstances surrounding all of this? Let's kind of like roll it back a little bit. So there's... Tons of people in Jerusalem. They're there for the Pentecost. They've been there um, probably for a while because Passover had, had would have been, you know, a few weeks, several weeks earlier. Um, Christ was crucified on the Passover. So there's a lot of people who were there. They were they would have been eyewitnesses to the events of what had happened. And do you remember what happened after Christ was risen from the dead? The disciples are all hiding out in the room because they think they're next. And what does Jesus do? He walks in. He shows up. He shows up, but to just them? No. Do you remember how many people he appeared to? The four, five hundred, five hundred people. He appeared to. Do you think some of those people were in Jerusalem for Pentecost? Probably. I'm sure they were. Okay, so now when we kind of put the entire picture together, Peter's giving this message. So let's kind of take a look at um, let's take a look at Peter's um, his message. So verses 14 through 21. Uh -huh. Acts 2. Acts. Acts 2. I'm like, we got three books going here, woman. <laughs> Which one? Verses 14 through 21 in Acts 2. And would anybody like to read those? I will. Okay. Thanks. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you. Fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. So what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, 
I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your older men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark, and the moon will turn blood red before that great but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, thanks. All right, so Peter's quoting the prophet Joel. Why would that have been important? They were familiar with prophets, right? I mean, so it's it's neat. So. In that, on the question, on one of our questions was, um, how did Peter explain what was happening that day? And then it also is, what were some of the evidences and proofs that he used that Jesus was who he said he was? So, um, so he used the prophet Joel, that that the pouring out of the Spirit on the last days. Now, we're two thousand years apart from what happened here. Would you, do you guys feel like we're in the last days? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. It's the beginning. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But what is happening? I mean, even according to what we just read, what's going on in our time today that we see that is in line with some of the Old Testament scripture? Chaos. Okay. Chaos. Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> okay. So cosmic, kind of like cosmic, you know, earthquakes and, okay. Weather changes. Weather changes. Thinking about themselves, going away from the Lord, just doing things. Right. California. All of California. All of California. <laughs> Almost. I'm sure that's in the Old Testament somewhere. California <laughs> is going to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. See, I mean, and that's. How, how do you guys pay attention to Israel's news and what's yeah. going on in the Middle East? Other countries. I know you do. Yeah, <laughs> coming against them right now, which is part of the prophecy. Right. The countries that are lying. Right. So, you know, I mean, Israel, us keeping an eye on what's going on in Israel is huge because it will certainly affect us, at least to the degree of the timeline of events of the last days. So, yeah, I mean, whether you like them or you don't, Trump is, is doing some pretty wild things that is, you know, wild according to the government. You know, acknowledging Israel as a nation. You know, acknowledging Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Um, and it just, I mean, it kind of just, to me, it's like exciting and scary at the same time. So I'm like, well, he's either the Antichrist or setting us up for one. I don't know. You know, it's just one of those weird, you see, you know, the blocks. It's kind of like Tetris. It's like all these little blocks are starting to fall into place. And so we have to pay attention to that. This is a very minute detail, but I think it's interesting. Um, in Israel, they're putting together all this stuff so that when they rebuild the temple, they have everything ready to put all this stuff in, and they built it, um, and they're putting it together exactly like it was, you know, a couple thousand years ago. One of the things they did was they dyed certain things on priest robes in purple, mm -hmm. and the purple came from a certain sea mollusk or something like that. And then it disappeared, and they couldn't find that until just recently. And they found it again, and they're using that amazing. exact same dye from that wow. thing that had disappeared for thousands of years, and it's back. Yeah. <laughs> and That's, I just thought yeah. that was just That's one more of those. Exactly. Kind of things. <laughs> those those aha yeah. moments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and just even some of the discoveries that you know, as as archaeologists are continuing to find discoveries in certain things. I mean, it's just. We have to pay so much attention to what's going on around us during these times because does the prophecy of Joel apply to us today? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, because I mean, I, I wouldn't be too terribly shocked if as as times grow worse and and I don't know, you know, whether you believe in the pre-trib, a pre-trib rapture or a post-trib, wherever you are on that, you know, some probably some pretty wackadoodle things are gonna. I mean, like people, Christians, real Christians, spontaneously jumping up and speaking in tongues, you know, just wherever. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I mean, because it's going to be, it's going to be times unlike anything we've ever seen. Um, well, and they talk about people will see visions or dream dreams mm -hmm. more. They'll have, you know, like Joseph. Or, you know, and we always that. thought of this as <clears throat> in the end times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This statement. Yeah. Not now. Right. But, yeah. Well, in every generation, in a way, has had the last days. In their generation, I mean, we think of last days as in as the end of the world. But Joel's, you know, he talks about the name, the day of the Lord, and every generation has thought it was their time. I'm, I'm certain that when Hitler was in uh, doing what he was sure. doing, they, we thought that was he was the Antichrist, and those were the end of days. You know how things were going. So, and there's been multitude, multiple Antichrists over over time. So. How is this important to us? We talked last week about preparing a testimony. Did you guys think about that this week, this last week, what you would tell somebody, what your very short testimony would be? Because guess what? <laughs> Whether we're prepared or not, the cool thing is I'm confident that when that day and time comes, God is going to open our mouth and stuff is going to come out and we won't have to think about it we won't have to have it written down and go like excuse me and pull out our little you know three by five cards <laughs> out of our pocket or our purse I mean it's just it's going to happen it's going to be very much like this so okay um, any last thoughts on that section because there's another section where he talks about Jesus uh, verses 22 through 36 He, verses 22 through 36, he basically, Peter, man, does he kind of gets in their face. You know, you guys did this. Jesus, whom you crucified. Um, and that struck a chord with them. Why do you think it meant something more to them at that point than it did when it was happening? Well, a lot of them had seen happen and all that stuff a lot of them were kind of followers and then they turned on him crucified him and then I think they remembered all that stuff too it's like this isn't just something that all of a sudden happened oh yeah remember Jesus he was doing all these miracles and somehow mm -hmm. he really did get resurrected and whoops <laughs> <laughs> oops well and I'm sure the 500 people that saw him they weren't exactly keeping it to themselves I'm sure that's where like Bob were right Right. Well, I mean, because simultaneously, you know, the Roman government was telling people that the body had been stolen. You know, they were doing all kinds of stuff to try to explain why he disappeared. So, okay. Um, what were some of the proofs that Peter mentioned about uh, the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah and he's risen? We just talked about one. Um, he went to Joel. But what else, you know, I mean, so we've got the fact that people saw him, you know, we just mentioned um, eyewitness accounts. Um, there's the prophecy. Well, who was one of the main ones that Peter spoke of in the prophecy regarding Jesus? David. David. Um, so he pointed to King David, who was, who was their, I mean, he was like the guy to the Jews. This is the kind of king they were looking for. Um, so when you guys have an opportunity to uh, witness to somebody, or, or even just like you're just chit-chatting about Bible stuff, and if you if you have the opportunity and the privilege to be able to do that in a calm, dull fashion with folks when they're not are trying to argue, um, what do you go to when you know if somebody were to say to you, "Well, I don't believe that you know Jesus was just a good teacher," what do you go to? to kind of help point them to proof, evidence? Because everybody's different. I try and um, tell them that 
tell them that there's no doubt that Jesus was a person and lived and that the only thing that people question seven bluntly is was he the son of God? And I say my belief is because all the prophecy in the Old Testament was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And not anything that he did was fulfilled a lot of times by the, the people around him and the things that happened. Mm, okay. And it was documented by a lot of those people, not people, not just the Jewish people, but others, you know, too. Okay. And I, I think, you know, that's part of the, the proof that helps me. I mean, not that I need proof, but yeah, you're trying to explain to people why why you believe he really was the son of God. Okay. And I think it's what if I tell somebody I tell them what he did to me. Mm-hmm. And you either take it or I know. So that's what I think. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, the, the historical documentation. And that's kind of the neat thing because you, you do find a lot of that in other texts outside of the Bible that just confirms the um, accuracy of the Bible. So, which is hugely important for those who always want to say that the Bible's not accurate and it contradicts itself and, and all of that. So, okay. So, yeah, there's lots of different um, there's lots of different ways, whether prophecy fulfilled, the, his, the historical facts, medical facts of the crucifixion, um, transformed lives. Have you guys ever seen a miracle of healing? Huh? Miracle of healing? Well, just seeing somebody heal oh, miraculously. Miracle. I thought you meant like a movie. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's a movie. That's a movie. You should watch it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it happens in many forms, yeah. but I mean, just, you know, watching, you know, experiencing something like that is huge. Okay. All right. Because it's, I mean, I think it's um, really important it really important for us you know to you know whatever speaks to us is typically what how we're going to relate it to someone else um, so that's that's a big deal but um, okay so one of the things another thing that was interesting one of the things that you know you kind of wrestle with because I've always I've always been challenged by the idea that the Jews were God's chosen people God gave them all of this up front. When Christ comes to earth and he's doing all of this, how easy it was for them to dismiss who he was, even though they had, you know, the Torah, they had the prophets, they had all of this to to look at. And yet they, you know, but I don't want to say that in condemnation because I don't want to say, oh, well, I would have, you know, I would have known because I'm pretty thick, so... But one of the things that they wrestled with that Barclay had actually brought up, and it would have been on page 30 of the Barclay commentary. Um, was that, let's see, on page 30, so one, two, the third paragraph, it's actually got the number three right in front of it. Um, and he starts out with saying that acts is out to prove that the sufferings and death and death of Christ were the fulfillment of prophecy. But the the fact that the Jews had such a hard time with this because the idea of a crucified Messiah was incredible because of their law in 20, Deuteronomy 21, 23, that anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. So to them, looking at Jesus being crucified would have pointed them to Deuteronomy rather than a Messiah. Do what do you guys think about that? Let's go to Deuteronomy just because there's Deuteronomy chapter twenty one. Actually, let's we're gonna look at he cites verse twenty three, but we're gonna read twenty two um, and twenty three. So uh Ms. Ernie, would you mind reading those verses, 22 and 23? If someone has committed a crime worthy of death, 
and is executed and hung on a tree. The body must not remain hanging from the tree overnight. You must bury the body that same day for anyone who is hung is cursed in the sight of God. In this way, you will prevent the defilement of the land and the Lord your God is giving you as your special possession. Okay. Um, so Barclay is basically stating that the Jews may have wrestled with Christ as the Messiah because of this verse, but who actually fulfilled this ver these verses? Uh, Judas. Judas. Yeah, but he, you know, I mean, and, and nobody took his body down, though. Right? He, he, we, we talked about that. We don't, I don't know who it was who was saying that they think maybe he fell off because of the decomposition of the body. Maybe his head snapped off. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay then. <laughs> so like that's interesting. Split up on his he guts. <laughs> burst open at the yes, and all his entrails fell out. What a lovely vision here. Um, but yeah, so that verse was fulfilled absolutely, but not through Christ. It was fulfilled through Judas, and it's kind of interesting that they would have missed that. <clears throat> that they, you know, potentially could have missed that simply because the the land, that whole plot of land was cursed after that too, which again simply fulfills because it was the desecration um, of the property. So that's kind of interesting there. Um, okay, so now Barclay also goes on to say um, in number four on page 30, that Acts stresses the resurrection as the final proof that Jesus was indeed God's chosen one. Acts has been called the gospel of the resurrection. To the early church, the resurrection was all important. We must remember this. Without the resurrection, there would have been no Christian church. So I know that, you know, we've heard numerous times, you know, we've heard Bill preach and we understand this, but I feel like, you know, for me, sometimes even, that the idea that Christianity is based on the fact that Christ was um, rose again, we're the only faith that preaches that, because all the other religions, you know, their leaders are in their tombs, they died, they're buried, they have a tomb, you can go visit their tombs, you can visit where supposedly Jesus, you know, the, uh, the tomb where he was laid, but have you ever really kind of let that thought sink in? I mean, what would you do if, I mean, could you follow a faith that their God or their prophet was dead? No? I mean, I hope you wouldn't. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, for some reason it just hit me. It's like, wow, you know, I don't, no wonder so many of the other religions are works-based. Because there's no hope. Without resurrection, there is zero hope of eternity. What about people who've never heard the message of Christ, but only another message? What about them? Well, God says that uh, his proof is in his creations. Okay. So that's how some people who don't even have a church, say other countries, some of them know about God. Mm -hmm. How did they know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think people just start questioning, you know, even in their the other religions, something clicks with something. Yeah, and they start Something's not right. Right. Because there is no that joy that you know you only have because of the Lord. It's just certain things. Mm -hmm. I think when you see other people too, you know, and then the why are you like you know? You always seem so happy, so fulfilled, and that opens the door to testimony. Then they, they witness, start. Yeah. Then they'll start searching, or they'll start seeking too. Well, and I can also go back to some of the prophecies of Joel. Um, there's been many documentations where people who have never heard about Christ, um, he appears to them in dreams and visions, and he tells them, and I mean, and they're convinced, you know, it's like, how did, 
you know, because you think about it, if you've never heard about Jesus and you've never seen, like, our stereotypical picture of him and you don't know the story, you know, he's got to be pretty convincing when he shows up in your dreams for you to be like, ah, okay. You know, because otherwise, why would you not chalk it up to, wow, I just had a really weird dream last night of some guy, you know? Isn't it like the, the girl that was painting? You know, the oh, yeah. The 12-year-old? Yeah. Because, right, yeah. Because she, the she was boy, a, like, an atheist. I think she was raised as an atheist. Mm -hmm. And then the little boy that saw Jesus or had a near death experience oh, yeah. verified the picture that she mm -hmm. painted. Yeah. Why would you not believe well, in that? Today's, in today's world of technology and everything else, there, you have to hear the word somewhere. I mean, you're going to start questioning because everywhere you go, um, but like the onset, you know, the visions and the dreams, right. and they'll be more so mm -hmm. in the end times. Yeah. So. I mean, and I look at it this way, in today's world of technology with all the CGI and the photoshopping and all the crazy, the things that can be accomplished on media that are fake pictures and all the things... God's going to have to pull out the stops. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that he wouldn't. You know, it's just like, it's got to be something that can only be attributed to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Can't be something that humans can do, that we can reproduce. Um, although the Antichrist does do strikingly similar things in the end times, but um, that's why it's so important we know our, our scriptures so that we can help others understand and point to that. Um, but as we finish, because I kind of wanted to spend a little bit of time on this, but we probably don't need to. Um, all of this produced a result. So the speaking in, in the tongues, the foreign languages, you know, Peter preaching to the people, people were convinced. They, they repented. You know, he said, repent and, you know, and follow Christ. And so they did. So, you know, thousands of people were coming to Christ at the time. And it had a natural um, fallout. So they would have all been in Jerusalem. They would have had all of these new converts. And Matthew 28, the Great Commission tells us that we are to make disciples of all nations. Okay, done. The next step was what? Do you remember? Once they're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then we are to do what? Right. Yeah. Well, right after, right out in, in Matthew 28, 19, says make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them my ways so that's what they were doing in verses 42 through 47 we see all the new believers everybody's gathering together they're breaking bread together they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to prayer so now this brand spanking new body of believers is coming together to learn doctrine to learn you know because they would have had to have learned how to take what they knew of the old testament and make it match with now what they've got in front of them and how to help others understand and learn as well. So how exciting do you think that would have been at those times for the new church? But needless to say, and I know we talked about this our first week, is it, um, it, it uh, caused a reaction, kind of like a, uh, it caused a chain reaction, you know, so there was, there was this ripple effect, you know, and they were spending time together and they were, you know, daily. so daily, every day. Daily. Page 43 in the Wearsby book, where it says the church walking in the spirit. He says the believers continued to use the temple for their place of assembly and ministry, but they also met in various homes. How do we do that here now? What do most churches do now to make that happen? Bible study. Yeah, so we've got like Okay, so we, we still meet in the temple, in church, on Sundays, and then we further our fellowship, our teaching, and all of that inside of Bible studies. So, you know, I say that to say that what, what would be the importance, you know, of us as followers inside of our Bible studies? What's the importance of us trying to get to know people in church and invite them in to a study or a life group? Witnessing to them. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a huge deal because if they don't. Okay. <clears throat> How long did you guys go to church before you 
reached that point almost, I don't want to say saturation, but you reached that point where you knew you needed more, but Sunday wasn't going to be the place where more was going to happen. Four or five years. Okay. I mean, everybody's different, of course, so this isn't a, oh, well, you're slow. <laughs> That's not it at all. Do you, I mean, how long was it for you guys? Did you, did you kind of put two and two together at that point? I did. I wanted it immediately. Did you? Because I was okay. interested in prophecy. Oh, okay. And that's what drew me back. Nice. Okay. All so right. I wanted as much of it as I could get. Nice. Good for you. Huh? Very cool. I'm kind of shy. <laughs> yeah. It, it depends on, it does, it depends on personality. You know, what your preconceptions are, um, you know, fears and, and worries. Because I know for me, I thought you had to know your Bible to go to Bible study, and that if you didn't, you weren't allowed, because it was people who knew their Bible sat around and talked about it. That's what I thought it was. So we avoided it for a while, and until Bill told us to. <laughs> but it's funny, because we did that survey, and that was exactly the biggest answer why they weren't going, is because people thought they had to know the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the Bible, like we on this, said was that when you have the notes there that kind of guide you with the scriptures mean it's hard if you just take it like a King James version to read and figure out what they're saying. I kind of thought Bible study would have been just what it said. You it have to study but the Bible. I, I so. know, but they right. think you have to know it first. Yeah. That was my mistake. Yeah. I thought you had to know it. Or yeah. because Perry was working up at COSO, is working up at COSO, seven on, seven off, he would always miss every other week. And I thought that wasn't allowed either. <laughs> if you couldn't make every single one, you can't have come and join us. <laughs> like, ugh. So that I asked. I just had to ask, I, you know, if this is the case, can we still join? And thankfully they said yes. And that so would be like, a good drama for the video is why people, you know, yeah, don't do it like this. Yeah, it would be. It would. That would be fun. Okay, so this week um, we're going to go ahead and do your homework on Chapter 3, but also kind of in that vein, if there's somebody that you met in church that is kind of at that place where they maybe they are ready for more and you know they're not in a study think about how you can invite them either to this one or encourage them into another study if this time doesn't work for them so that we can be doing what jesus asked us to do in matthew 28 19 through 20 and be part of that process so and if there is somebody and if you need help um let me know, you know, like if you're going to pass out with the thought of asking, inviting somebody, <laughs> don't let that stop you. So, and Miss Kyra, she does Bible study on Thursday mornings. I know you're on summer break right now. Um, yeah, Thursday mornings from 9 to 11. And it looks like you're going to be in on Gideon. Gideon? Ooh, that's fun. Okay. Nice. Priscilla Schreier. Oh, very good. Okay, any final thoughts before we pray? Okay. Uh, Lord, thanks again for this time. Um, I just feel like it's certainly not enough time to just dive into the amazing mysteries and riches of your word. But thank you that you never quit teaching us. And I pray that as we go out throughout our week, that the things that we have learned already, um, we would be able to experience a very real-life practical application, Father, because um, that's kind of how things sink in, is when we get to put into practice what we've read. And so we thank you um, that you are a good, amazing God. And I just pray for the safety and the health and blessing of everybody here until we meet again next week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.